It's not uncommon for children to think their parents are mean every now and then, but what if your parents were actually evil? Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea, and if you've never been here before, nice to meet you. Today's video is about Frederick Walter Stephen West. He was born on September 29th, 1941, at Brickenton Cottage in England. He was actually born to farm laborers Walter Stephen West and Daisy Hannah Hill. Despite the poverty that they were living in, they actually had six more children, one after the other, within the next 10 years. But Fred always stayed his mother's favorite. They had a very close relationship and Fred did whatever his mom asked him to. It was said by people that knew him that Fred seemed like any other boy growing up, with his aunt later saying that he had always been such a nice boy. It seems like it's always the good, nice boy that turns out to be the bad boy. However, there had been some serious allegations of what was really happening in the West household. Fred claimed that his mother introduced him to an adult behavior when he was only 12 years old. Fred also claimed that he had to engage in really disgusting acts with animals and that his father actually committed the type of crime when families do things together that are indecent. His father was making him do this with his younger sisters, but none of these claims were actually confirmed. They could have just been his own fantasies, but whatever the case may be, something was just not right with him. Fred wasn't doing well in school and eventually he dropped out in December 1956 at the age of 15 to become a farm laborer like his parents. A couple years later, Fred got into a severe motorcycle accident that left him with a fractured skull. I always point out coincidences between murders and one of the things I do talk about is traumatic brain injury. This seems to be one of the many common threads between individuals that end up committing these heinous crimes, so I just wanted to point that out. He also had a broken arm and a fractured leg. He was in a coma for seven whole days and then they actually had to place a metal plate in his head. According to some experts, this may have affected his behavior, which I believe is true as well, and the impulse control later in his life. And as if this wasn't enough for Fred to go through, he suffered another head injury just two years later when he fell off a fire escape when he was at a youth club. In 1961, Fred's own sister accused him of doing something with her that's indecent and she told her mother that this had been going on for at least six months to a year. Fred was then arrested and he ended up openly admitting to police that he was doing things that were indecent and he acted like there was nothing wrong with it. He thought that everyone else did this. Is that the brain injury? I don't know, but he said, well, doesn't everyone do it? No, they don't. It's not good. It's nasty. However, the case against him completely collapsed because his sister did not want to testify, which I can understand, I guess. It is your brother after all. Fred was then banished from his household because his family disowned him. He did reconcile at some point with his parents, but the relationship was never the same anymore. Most of his family members wanted nothing to do with him, which again is understandable. Despite being a person who does indecent things to younger people, Fred was able to marry his girlfriend, Rena Costello, in November of 1962, and the two of them moved to Cobridge. Rena herself was not a good girl. She had a police record for burglary and doing indecent things for money with men. So she was also pregnant with another man's child at the time, and this child would later have the name Charmaine. Eventually, the couple also had a child of their own in July of 1964, a daughter named Anne Marie. At the same time, Fred worked as an ice cream van driver, which is just creepy in and of itself, like the music and the hmm, I don't know. It just seems perfect job for someone who's gonna end up doing all these things. And you could have guessed, this gave him access to teenagers who would unfortunately fall prey to 
his indecent interest. The other thing is he was actually addicted to doing the deed and he would demand it from Rena on a daily basis. And he wasn't interested in the regular vanilla. Oh, he wasn't vanilla. He also wanted the type where you go ahead and tie, you know, someone up. And he was interested in S&M all hours of the day and night, according to Rena. Tragically, on November 4th, 1965, Fred accidentally ran over and took the life of a boy in Glasgow with his van. The police decided it wasn't Fred's fault, that it was clearly an accident, and the police decided to drop any charges that could come of it, and they said, you know, there was no wrongdoing. Fred was also really concerned with losing his job at the time, so he, Rena, and their two children, plus a friend named Anna McFall, ended up moving together to Gloucester. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm notorious for mispronouncing things. And it was there that Fred found a job in a, a meat market. You know, the kind of thing where you take the animals in and make food out of them. But according to some researchers, this was actually a turning point in Fred's life. It may have been the catalyst for his twisted obsessions with death and doing things to living creatures and people and you know the whole like taking apart type of thing. Fred and Rena's marriage began to fall apart at this time and she moved to Scotland leaving the couple's children behind which probably wasn't the best idea. I don't know why a mother would do that. No judgment but also just observing that I just wouldn't do that. A few months later she would come back and she found Fred living in a caravan with their kids and their friend Anna. Early in 1976, Anna became pregnant with Fred's child. He is just reproducing left and right and center. And she tried her best to get Fred to divorce Rena and marry her instead. Why? I, I don't know. Maybe he could charm the ladies. Fred's response was definitely not what Anna was hoping for. She was only 18 years old at the time and she wanted marriage. That's not what she got from Fred. Instead, July 1967, Fred took her life. Let's just say he decided to take apart and do things that were heinous with her fingers and her toes, and then Fred would put them under the ground and the rest of her remains under the ground, the same way Chris Watts did to Shanann Watts. And I think you know what I'm talking about since Shanann was pregnant at the time. So there were two lives taken in this situation. That is so sad. I'm just looking back to everything that happened to Shanann and it just, it's gut-wrenching. Anna was never reported missing, but her remains were later found in 1994. Following Anna's disappearance, Rena actually returned to live with Fred and then the couple relocated to Lake House Caravan Park. And even though their relationship improved, Rena left again. And not long after, Fred would meet his next wife and lifelong accomplice, Rosemary Letts. Rosemary was born November 29th, 1953, and her mother struggled through a very difficult pregnancy, which left both of her parents suffering from really poor mental health conditions. Another common thread, we see in a lot of people who end up becoming very violent or murderers, the mental health of their parents usually play a role as well. Rose had really poor performance in school and she also exhibited bouts of aggression. And this may have resulted from, this is so terrible, electroshock therapy that was actually administered to her depressed pregnant mother. Thank God this is not allowed anymore. It's just shocking. I didn't mean to say, uh, no pun intended, I am so sorry, but it is just shocking that they would do that to a pregnant woman. Rose's family life was not an easy one. Her parents' marriage was very turbulent. Her father had paranoia and paranoid schizophrenia, and he had violent tendencies. Rose's mother, Daisy, oh, Rose and Daisy, I just noticed that, moved them both out of the family home, but Rose later returned to live back with her father. And during this time, Rose met Fred. Just if one thing had changed, 
you know? If one thing hadn't happened, things would have been different. So even though Rose's father, Bill, wasn't a perfect husband himself, he saw Fred as a completely unfit boyfriend for Rose, even decided to call social services and they showed up at Fred's trailer park to threaten him. But this didn't stop Rose and Fred because soon she was pregnant with Fred's child. And meanwhile, Fred was sent to prison for various thefts and failure to pay fines for previous offenses that he had committed. She would later give birth to their daughter, Heather, in 1970. Rose ended up resenting having to take care of Rena's children and she often mistreated them, which is just so unfortunate. We always hear of the evil stepmother, but it's just so sad. These children haven't done anything wrong. It's actually believed that the pressure of caring for three children while still a child herself was a trigger for Rose's violent outbursts. One day in the summer of 1971, Charmaine suddenly disappeared. But the truth was that Rose most likely lost her temper entirely and did away with Charmaine. How can you do that? A short time after this, when Fred was released from prison, he would put her body under the ground and do the same thing he did before to his first victim, taking away their, you know, phalanges, probably because he didn't want them to be identified. And it was at this point that he had a really firm hold on Rose. Rena had been in contact with her daughter from time to time and she grew really worried because she couldn't get a hold of Charmaine. She came to look for her daughter and to discuss custody of both of her daughters with Fred, but nobody saw her alive after that. It's believed that her life was also taken by him putting his hands around her neck and we know what happens there if you do it for an extended amount of time. Chris Watts, in the same way that he had done with Anna, doing the same exact thing with the fingers and toes and putting the rest in bags and then putting them under the ground. And he did this close to a cluster of trees in this field called Letterbox Field. Later on January 29th, 1972, Fred and Rose got married. And in June, they had yet another daughter together and they named her Mae West. Fred and Rose decided that they needed a proper place to raise their growing family and also to accommodate Rose's business that she was running on the street, if you know what I mean. So they moved to an area that would support that and they moved into a house at the address of 25 Cromwell Street. Fred began to talk about some plans for the basement of their new home and he uh, was calling it his chamber. It's a place where things happen to people against their will and that's what he was calling his basement area. His first client, as he liked to put it, for this chamber was unfortunately his daughter, Anne Marie. He repeatedly did this indecent thing that's reserved for adults that are not related to each other. I think you know what I mean. And the worst part about it, if that wasn't bad enough, was that Rose, her stepmother, helped him carry this out. This was a regular occurrence for Anne Marie, which is just so sad. And they told Anne Marie that if she ever told anyone, she would suffer more pain. And so she never told anyone. She just kept it a secret. A lot of times children also think these things are normal because that's all they know. But then Fred and Rose's behavior started to extend beyond the family. In late 1972, they found a young girl. She was in her teens. Her name was Caroline Owens and they hired her as their nanny. Again, this is so heinous, I can't put it into words, especially on this channel, but Caroline was trapped. They would not let her go, and indecent things happened to her that they did to their own daughter. Surprisingly, Caroline was able to get out of the house in one piece, and charges were brought against Fred and Rose. I don't know how he did it, but Fred was able to convince the judge that Caroline had actually consented. Yeah, she consented to that. So both Fred and Rose escaped with just fines. So they're free to do this again to an innocent person. Yeah, it, this happens all the time in a lot of these cases and it just really bothers me that they don't do more about this. It's like they don't take it seriously and then something else happens. And of course, unfortunately, this resulted in many other people losing their lives over the next several years. Eight young women had somehow made their way 
to 25 Cromwell Street. Some of them were given a place to stay. Fred and Rose sort of disguised this as uh, hospitality and other people that came were there for employees. The women's names were Linda Go, Lucy Partington, Juanita Mott, the next one's hard, Therese Seigenthaler, Allison Chambers, and Shirley Robinson. There was also a teenager. She was a schoolgirl, and her name was Carol Ann Cooper. And all of these people became victims of Fred and Rose. After these brutal attacks and keeping them in the chamber, the same thing that happened to all the other victims happened to them, and they were put under the cellar floor. Rose ended up having several more children with Fred, some with her clients, and Fred's interest in his own daughters continued. And when Anne Marie moved out, he decided to switch his attention to another victim. And that was her younger siblings, Heather and May. Heather would resist her father, and because of that, she was treated really poorly and she would get beaten for that. Nevertheless, Heather told her friends about what was going on. Unfortunately, her parents found out about this. I don't know how, I don't know who would tell. And Fred did the same thing to her that he had done to his previous victims and she was put under the ground in the back of their garden. I, th this is just too much, it's too much. Good thing for the rest of the world, Fred and Rose's luck had started to fade and in mid-1992, their other daughter, Louise, garnered the courage to confide in a close friend. She told the friend what her father had done to her, to her siblings, all the siblings before her, and the friend ended up telling her own mother what had happened. So the friend went to her mother and in response, the friend's mother did the right thing. She anonymously informed the police and then on August 6, 1992, the police searched the West household with a search warrant to look for any evidence that this abuse was going on. All of the children that were in the house were fortunately put in foster care. That was the better choice. The following day, they were put in foster care. Rose had attempted to take her own life at this time and she was found by her son, Stephen, and he revived her. It was in February, 1994, a warrant was obtained to search the Cromwell Street house and the garden. Police ended up finding the remains of two of the victims. One of them didn't have the head anymore and the other one the authorities had suspected might be Shirley Robinson since she was still missing at the time. Fred made it easy. He just claimed sole responsibility for the murders and he admitted that the cellar contained more remains. He continued to cooperate, surprisingly, and he also ended up revealing the whereabouts of Rena, along with Anna and Charmaine, who were all elsewhere. At this time, Rose tried her best to distance herself from Fred because at this point, she claimed that she was also a victim, that she was afraid of him and she was just doing what he said because she didn't want to get hurt. Do I believe this? Part of me does. She was young when they got together. She probably seen him as some kind of authority figure and you're also afraid that something's gonna happen to you. So you're quiet and you stay quiet. Again, I just don't think that's an excuse because a human life is so important and there's got to be a way somehow, I always think there's gotta be a way somehow that you can tell someone, but I think they've just been trained and just they're so afraid that they just can't do it. But police were not convinced that she was innocent. Given the numbers of people that have been murdered in the house and her participation in the other things, when she allowed these indecent things to happen to these other women, there was just no innocence there. On December 13th, 1994, Fred was actually charged with 12 counts of murder. He was taken into custody at Winston Green Prison in Birmingham. However, before his trial even began, Fred West took his own life in his cell. He did this with knotted bed sheets. He chose the quick way out, the Versace killer. He did the same thing. It's common. They're cowards. They can take other people's lives, but when it comes down to it, they don't want to face the music. He did end up leaving a note and he left a creepy wish. He wanted to be buried next to his daughter, Heather, as well as his stepdaughter, 
and his first wife. Rose West ended up going to trial on October 3rd, 1995, and her stepdaughter, Anne Marie, was one of the witnesses. That's very brave. This happened in the case we talked about with Anthony Allen Shore. His daughter, Tiffany, actually was a witness at his trial. Rose was actually found guilty of 10 murders and sentenced to life in prison. She will thankfully never be released. In 1996, the House of Horrors at 25 Cromwell Street was demolished and the site was turned into a pathway. People believe that Fred and Rose had way more victims than just the 12 that everybody knows about. And that could be true because it seemed like it was so easy for them to lure people in with the promise of a place to stay or a job. So I believe the same and we will never ever know. The truth just goes with the murderers who did this and a lot of times we don't know the truth unless they come out with it. Can't hear from Fred. Not sure if Rose ever will. I just think of it like this. If you already did all these crimes, what's the point in not saying you're already in prison for life or in some cases going to get the death penalty? So why not just admit so that other families can have that closure? And maybe these individuals are just so narcissistic or selfish or want to hang on to any piece of being a good person that they don't want to admit to it. I don't know. You tell me in the comments what you think. Oh, well, that's it. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so very much for watching. Don't forget to check out my podcast. It's called Critique a Killer. And it's every week on not only Apple Podcasts, it's on Spotify and pretty much every other podcasting platform. But I also go live for this podcast on the Stereo app. So don't forget to check that out. And again, if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe and turn the notification bell on. Okay, I will see you in my next video. Bye.